to Ollie and to uh, Craig for the invitation to speak in a really interesting session. So, uh, how similar are the metaphysics of indigenous societies and the theories proposed by Western post-humanist scholars? I ask because a parallel is frequently drawn between the two, although it's not always clear what the justification for this is. Why, for example, should the so-called new animism be placed within the broader post-humanist theoretical family alongside object-oriented ontologies, new materialism, symmetrical archaeology, and the like? In this respect, it seems that one of the key umbrella concepts, a term often used to link together all these different theoretical strands, is the idea of relational ontologies. In the sense that writers such as Bruno Latour and Karen Barad are routinely described as positing a relational ontology, while the metaphysical commitments of many indigenous societies are often referred to using the same terms. This would imply, then, that actor network theory, say, is in some sense similar to how indigenous peoples understand the world, or at least much more similar than uh, Cartesianism. That might be true, but I think things start to get a bit slippery at that point. In this respect, indigenous metaphysics occupies a somewhat unusual disciplinary status. A great deal has been written on the precise convergences and divergences that might be seen in the Deleuzian assemblage versus the Latourian actor network, while the writings of Graham Harmon in the vein of object-oriented ontology clearly have a deep engagement with Latourian ideas and texts, albeit a critical one in some cases. Similarly, Jane Bennett repeatedly cites Deleuze and Latour in her discussions of vibrant matter, and so on and so on. By contrast, indigenous metaphysics doesn't take the form of a canonical body, ca canonical, bo canonical body of philosophical work, that is the product of a single group of writers. There is no clear indigenous equivalent to a thousand plateaus or we have never been modern. As a result, indigenous metaphysics gets deployed in a rather loose way, often as a rhetorical buttress for the overarching point that the posthumanist philosopher is trying to make. Indigenous uh, cosmology therefore gets drawn in repeatedly as a supporting element, but its purpose is seldom to actually produce an account of indigenous metaphysics per se. So the first question is, is it correct to see indigenous ontologies as a variety of relational ontology? Typically, it is opposition to modernist dualisms that define relational ontologies, that is, a rejection of an a priori or absolute distinction between humans and things, nature and culture, subjects and objects, etc. For most proponents of a relational metaphysics, it is also important that no kinds of being are essential, that is, they are not manifestations of a pre-existent or fixed type, but rather they are constantly emergent, as Ben Alberti has put it, uh, in the, a cons a re sorry, the inhabitants of a relational world that is in a constant process of becoming. That seems fair enough to me with respect to the society that occupies most of my work, namely the ancient Incas. For example, the Incas world was filled with lithic persons, such as the one you can see here. The Quechua term is waka, and such beings could eat and drink, foretell the future, and engage in acts of violence or warfare. Some were even executed for treason. It therefore seems reasonable to assert that with respect to Inca metaphysics, the modernist divide between humans and things, or between nature and culture, had little relevance. Moreover, lithic persons like wakas are only persons so, so long as they continue to receive material offerings from human beings, libations of blood and beer, tributes of coca leaf and llama fat. Indeed, the Inca state maintained an entire bureaucracy to monitor which wakas were supposed to receive material offerings and when they were due to receive them. Lithic persons that offended the Incas in some way or made themselves enemies of the state would have their supplies cut off, after which they were referred to as atixa. This is less a death in the Western sense, where one's ontological status shifts from living to non-living, but more like deactivating, deactivating a computer by cutting off its electricity supply. Just like a computer, a waka can always be reactivated again at some future point, becoming once again a person. The same, incidentally, was true of humans, who in their mummified form could continue to receive food and drink and thus be active social persons long after what we would call their death. Fleshy persons then, like the lithic variety, were only persons so long as they continued to receive material sustenance from others. <coughs> 
All this sounds a lot like what posthumanist theorists mean when they talk about entities that are constituted by constant processes of becoming rather than essences. But is this a real similarity, or are we merely saying that the Incas didn't see the world like modern Westerners do? In other words, is it just a negative resemblance rather than an actual resemblance? For instance, neither Islam nor Hinduism regard the divine realm as a trinity comprised of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That doesn't mean Islam and Hinduism are really all that alike, it just means they're not Christian, which although true is a pretty obvious and, and rather banal point. By analogy, the assumption often seems to be that indigenous societies operated on a metaphysics that is pre-humanist or pre-modern, and therefore this must make them similar to post-humanists. The difficulty here is that there are lots and lots of ways to be pre-humanists, that is to be pre-modern. But there's pretty much only one way to be post-humanist. Here I'm going to be controversial by arguing that all post-humanist thought is rather homogenous. That statement will no doubt raise uh, some heckles, but it is important to remember that everything is homogenous when viewed from a particular scale, and conversely everything is heterogeneous when uh, observed from the right vantage point. For me the best analogy here is to look at the classical theological disputes of late antiquity. The Monophysites believed that although Christ had two natures, his divine nature completely overwhelmed and consumed his human nature. The Chalcedonian position, which later became the Orthodox view, was that Christ's two natures coexisted in perfect synthesis, always fully human and fully divine at the same time. For participants in the 5th century uh, theological dispute, the gulf between these two camps was profound, and it was a debate on which the very understanding of the universe depended and for which many people died and, uh, for their heresies. But if your vantage point were something other than Christian theology, say Hinduism, for example, this massive difference between the Monophysites and the Chalcedonians starts to look like a very narrow and local disagreement. So the thought experiment I'm proposing here is something like where we imagine an Inca Amalta, their word for a knowledge expert or intellectual, reflecting on the premises of post-humanist thought from a radically external, that is, an ancient Andean perspective perhaps like a hypothetical Hindu philosopher looking on on the Christian theological disputes of the 4th and 5th centuries. Perhaps the first similarity that would occur is the way in which aggregate relations themselves are presented in post-humanist theory. The actor networks of Latour, Ingalls, uh, meshworks, Deleuzian assemblages, or Baradian, um, well it's quite different though, uh, but uh, Hodarian entanglements. A variety of relational clouds that I will refer to acronymically as NEMAs. <laughs> Whether presented in discursive or graphical form, the nemas are virtually always described as non-hierarchical, de-centered, and unstructured bundles of relations. All nema relations are primordially identical, or put another way, they are all coeval. What I mean by this is that in classic humanist or modernist thought, there are fundamentally different kinds of relations in the universe. There are, for example, social relations, which are different from natural relations. So the way a human couple forms a social bond is quite different ontologically from the way two hydrogen atoms form a molecular bond. For a posthumanist, however, the very divide between the social and the natural is the subject of their critique. Of course, this is not to say that posthumanists deny the existence of natural and social entities or hierarchy and structure, or even that couples and hydrogen atoms are distinctive entities. It's just that none of these things exist primordially. In other words, they do not precede relations, rather they are brought into being through relations. The technical term for this, one we've encountered a bunch of times already today, is ontological flatness. Again, something which uh, most nemas share uh, in the eyes of their theor theoretical uh, proponents. For a humanist, reality has a primordial topography, whereas for the posthumanist, topography only emerges via relational interactions. We also see a strong similarity in how new relations are thought to arise across the various nemas. There is an emphasis on connections being made unpredictably and without any predetermined structure. As Deleuze and Guattari put it, any point of horizon can be connected to any other and must be. While Latour writes of the scientist in the laboratory making strange allies and odd alliances with microbes and various other non-humans. New relations uh, can only appear can therefore appear anywhere and between any points, and they can disappear just as easily. The contrast with Inca metaphysics could not be more profound. For the Incas, there can be no primordial condition of equality. Hierarchy, and specifically hierarchies based on genealogical descent, are fundamental to the relational construction of all Inca reality. 
While it is true that the Inca saw the world as filled with communities of human and non-human persons with little regard for modernist ontological divides, every relation took the form of what we would call kin relations. All the non-human persons of the Inca world, like the Wakas uh, we've already discussed, related to humans and to each other as kin. When humans fed lithic persons, they were referred to as the sons and brothers of the Waka. In fact, the whole point of feeding them was to make the Waka, the, the lithic persons, members of one's own family. Even the most potent non-humans, like mountains, were invariably understood as the fathers or progenitors of their associated human communities. Not only did non-humans relate to humans as kin, relations between one non-human and another reflected the same premise. This mountain is called Bakai Vilka, which has a husband, Salkantai. Salkantai has a brother, another mountain, called Ausangate, who's surrounded by a variety of smaller peaks who are all his children, the nieces and nephews of uh, uh, Bakai Vilka and Salkantai, and so on and so on. So human-human relations were always kin relations. Non-human, non-human relations were always kin relations. And relations between humans and non-humans were always kin relations as well. Even the Spanish conquistadors, European invaders, who from our perspective were as foreign to the Andes as it was possible to be, were initially <coughs> described by the Incas as vera coaches, that is, as a kind of ancestor. For the Incas, the world was still relational. But its primordial structure was not like this. Rather, it was like this, where hierarchy was the basis to all things, and more specifically, a hierarchy based on the principle of genealogical descent. This principle applied not only to persons, whether human or non-human, but to entities that were less than persons as well. In other words, it was true for parts as well as for wholes. For example, the different ears on a, on a corn stalk, even in modern Quechua-speaking communities, are understood as exemplifying hierarchical relations of descent. The first ear to appear is the mother, while the subsequent ears are her children, which are placed in ordinal rank, i.e. as firstborn child, secondborn child, and so on. The same thing is observed in the parts that make up human bodies. Within the human hand, the thumb is the first digit and the ancestral mother, distinguished from her children, the four fingers that are enumerated as firstborn, secondborn, thirdborn, and fourthborn. We distinguish fingers and thumbs morphologically in terms of shape and also in terms of function. In the indigenous Andes, they are distinguished in terms of intergenerational descent and sibling birth order. To use a Deleuzean term or terminology then, the Incas saw all relations as inherently arborescent or tree-like. The reverse, that is rhizomatic relations, would for the Incas have been impossible to exist in the universe as they understood it. Fingers and thumbs simply could not ever be coeval. They must relate like members of a lineage or descent group. In an Andean context, this is the structure that relations must and must always have. Primordial branches or ancestors give rise to junior branches who in turn generate tertiary branches, quaternary branches, and so on in a similar vein. In Western genealogical thinking, new relations must always be added at the most junior point. The Incas did not see it quite like that, insofar as it was possible to create new ancestors given the inherent malleability of time in Andean metaphysics. The already mentioned notion that foreign invaders, for example, could be incorporated into Andean societies as ancestor beings. In other words, the Incas were happy to add new relations at the most senior branches of the tree, not only the most junior ones. But still, the only shape that relations can ever take is a hierarchy of trunks, branches, and twigs. Given the tendency to analyze post-human theory from within the premises of its own thought, I think its historic origins within the political philosophy of the modern West are consistently overlooked. Indeed, the political underpinnings of all the Nemas are very similar, although this is not necessarily the radical politics that many of their proponents claim, but rather a much more traditional politics that arises from an Enlightenment foundation. I'll refer to these politics as liberal, for want of a better term, although it is important to stress that liberal is not a synonym for all of modern or Western politics, since there are various political strands within the Western tradition that are distinctively not liberal. So what do I mean by liberal? Perhaps the most basic proposition of liberal politics is that hierarchy is a relational phenomenon in the sense that it doesn't exist primordially. I've already talked about this in terms of the fundamental egalitarianism or ontological flatness of the various nemas. But the oldest incarnation of this proposition is in the political philosophy of the classic Enlightenment thinkers like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Thomas Hobbes, and John Locke. Rousseau, for example, dismissed the idea that there was any natural hierarchy between men, meaning that in the imaginary world of the state of nature, before social relations came to exist, men existed in their primordial form without hierarchy. 
For Enlightenment theorists, it was only through the social contract that hierarchy came into being between men. Uh, and the gender is deliberate here, of course. Uh, 17th century Enlightenment thinkers did actually mean men, not humans in general. Uh, modern liberal thought tends to draw the boundaries uh, more broadly, including all adult humans within its definition of primordial egalitarianism. This is sharply opposed to other modernist political philosophies that regard hierarchies as uh, not social but primordial, uh, that is, as pre-social. A classic example would be fascism, which certainly does not see all people as being equal in the state of nature. This is, in fact, one of the great divides about uh, which modernist politics arranges itself. On one side, there are the liberal traditions, where the primordial state of being is egalitarian and hierarchy is a product of social relations. On the other, there are the anti-liberal traditions, where hierarchies, whether based on race, gender, or some other bodily characteristic, are perceived as natural and exist prior to the individual's entry into social relationships. Note, however, that neither tradition opposes hierarchy per se. They just differ over whether it is properly a social or pre-social phenomenon. Theorists of the various nemas tend to have a very liberal take on the distinction between egalitarianism and hierarchy. For them, the universe is fundamentally non-hierarchical in its original constitution. Actor networks, meshworks, entanglements, and assemblages are all primordially equal, ontologically flat, with no inherently greater capacities adhering to human subjects as opposed to objects. Of course, no NEMA theorist denies hierarchy as a possibility. The point is that hierarchy emerges through relations rather than having any a priori existence. But then this is the basic tenet of all liberal politics. Humans are equal in the state of nature, but become unequal through the social contract. By extension, actants within the actor network are inherently equal, but become hierarchically differentiated through relational processes of alliance building, or what Latour would call trials of strength. Latour is actually quite explicit on this point. In his discussion on the Parliament of Things, he says, The Enlightenment has a dwelling place at last. Natures are present, but with their representatives, scientists who speak in their name. Societies are present, but with the objects that have been serving as their ballast from time immemorial. Actor network theory is the final fulfillment of Enlightenment political philosophy, not a rejection of it. We could point to similar correspondences with more modern varieties of liberalism, or indeed neoliberalism, as well. For theorists of globalization, for example, one of its great virtues is flatness. Thomas Friedman, being the most uh, famous proponent of this idea, and pictured here is uh, his book, uh, bestseller on the topic. For posthumanists, ontological flatness is similarly admired. And the terms that globalization theorists use to describe the modern economic order non-hierarchical, decentered, constantly emerging and re-emerging, unpredictable, unstructured, are uncannily similar to the terms often used in post-humanist uh, descriptions of the various nemas. I don't want to uh, belabor the point, although I do think there are lots of ways in which posthumanist thought betrays a very historically situated political philosophy. But I don't highlight its politics in order to critique it. This is not a good politics versus bad politics kind of argument that I'm making. The Inca's metaphysics of genealogical hierarchy was the basis for building a vast and highly violent empire. There was nothing cuddly uh, about it, and I don't present it to you here because I think you should regard it as better than the liberal politics that I've been talking about. The goal of my argument is simply to highlight the fact that post-humanist thought isn't coming from nowhere. And even though it is presented in highly universalistic or often meta-ontological terms, it actually reflects the political perspectives of a very specific set of times and places. As archaeologists, this should give us some pause when we choose to apply post-humanist theory to the ancient past, in contexts where, like the Incas, the people concerned may not have been particularly liberal in their views. In that vein, indigenous thought is perhaps better used to understand the situatedness of post-humanism to contextualize it, rather than a rhetorical device for its ongoing propagation. Thank you.